This revision video is the second in a series about the A-level chemistry topic of kinetics. In this one we're going to look at Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions and how they vary with changes in temperature and also how temperature impacts the rate of reaction. In the previous video we met the idea that in order to react particles need to collide and they need to have a minimum amount of energy that we call the activation energy. We can use a graph called a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which shows how much energy the different particles have to say what proportion of the particles do have sufficient energy to react when they collide and what proportion don't. On the x-axis we have the amount of energy and on the y-axis we have the number of particles that have that energy. The graph should never touch the y-axis because none of the particles have no energy. That would suggest they've reached absolute zero. The graph will always look like a slightly skewed normal distribution with a long tail or asymptote going to the right. The area under the curve represents the total number of particles, which is important when we start redrawing the graph to represent a change in conditions. You can also see that we've marked the activation energy and any particle to the right of this line will participate in successful collisions, whereas particles to the left won't react even when they collide because they just don't have enough energy. On this graph, we can label the most probable amount of energy, which you can think of as being a bit like the mode. If I was to pick a particle at random, that's the most likely amount of energy it would have. This is going to be the peak of the graph. The mean amount of energy will be slightly to the right of this because of the skew of the curve. You don't need to be able to draw it on with no help, but you might get this as a multiple choice question saying which of these letters represents the most probable energy and which one represents the mean energy. As long as the overall shape of the distribution remains the same, with the most probable energy still in the same place, just the height of the peak changing, that tells us that the temperature is still the same because the overall proportion of particles that have each amount of energy hasn't changed, but the pressure has changed. So my purple line here would represent there being fewer particles in the same space, so it's a lower pressure environment. One of the most common things that you're likely to be asked to do with a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is to redraw it, representing the same reaction at either a higher or a lower temperature. In order to do this, you need to bear two key things in mind. The first one, fairly obviously, is that at a higher temperature, on average, each particle will have slightly more energy. What this is going to mean in terms of how you draw it is that your graph is going to skew slightly to the right. If you pick any point on the x-axis, then when you redraw the graph at a higher temperature, there should be more particles to the right of that, so more area, than there were when you had the lower temperature graph. The second thing to bear in mind is that the area under the curve represents the total number of particles, so the area under the curve can't change. This means that as you skew the graph to the right, it's also going to get flatter. 2020 is a really good year to be learning about Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions because we've all seen those flatten the curve diagrams with coronavirus. And that's exactly what happens as you take a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and you raise the temperature. So here's an example of the same reaction happening at a higher temperature. And there are some key things you need to recognise. The first one is that the peak will be lower. And this is because as it's skewed to the right, the whole thing just has to come down in order to maintain the area under the curve. The second thing is that it is skewed to the right, so your peak is going to be further right than your original most probable energy was. The third thing you notice is that when the graph starts to flatten off, it's going to remain higher. So the two curves will only cross each other in one place. The particles that are now shaded in blue represent ones that wouldn't have collided successfully in the original reaction, but now are. So the area of that blue section represents the increase in rate of reaction. Time for a quick check to make sure that all that made sense. So pause the video and write down an answer to each of these seven questions. For number seven, you're going to need to draw my original curve and then draw the other curve on top of it so that you can see how the two of them are different to each other. On a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the y-axis always represents the number of particles, but the x-axis is the energy that they have. The most probable energy of the particles is always represented by the peak of the graph, so that's going to be D. Remember, we're interested in the amount of energy, not the number of particles that have that energy, in which case it will be A. The mean energy of the particles is going to be E, and the activation energy is F. The area under the curve represents the total number of particles, and our lower temperature graph might look a bit like this. So key things to note here. It starts at the origin. It has a higher peak than my original curve, and it's skewed to the left, 
the asymptote is below my original curve and it has the same overall area as that original curve. We've started talking about the impact of temperature on Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, but actually we also need to link this back to rate of reaction. So here's an example of a reaction where some calcium carbonate has been added to some acid, and so carbon dioxide gas is given off, and this can be collected and measured. So how would this curve look different if we did the same reaction, changing nothing except for the temperature, which is higher? You've probably realised straight away that it should be a steeper initial curve. But what some people forget is that also the reaction needs to finish at the same height because we haven't changed the amounts of any of the reactants. So we're going to get a steeper curve, but also it's going to reach a plateau where the reaction has stopped much earlier. Increasing the temperature of a reaction increases its rate because as we heat the reaction, we transfer thermal energy to the particles, which then use this as kinetic energy and move around faster. A higher proportion of the particles have the activation energy and therefore a higher proportion of the collisions are successful. This is the point you need to be emphasising. At GCSE we gave you credit for talking about the particles moving faster, but at A level we really want to hear about the proportion that have the activation energy and therefore the proportion of successful collisions. This is quite a simplistic representation, but I do find that it helps. Imagine that in my reaction I only have six particles of a particular type and each one has a different amount of energy. Those that have more than the line labelled activation energy are able to successfully collide, whereas those that don't can't. So out of my particles, half are able to react and half aren't. If I heat this reaction, then all of the particles gain more energy. The three particles that could already successfully collide still can, but now there's a fourth particle that suddenly has more energy than the activation energy and it is also able to successfully collide. So now four of my particles can react rather than just three. We can see this quite clearly when we look at our Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. The blue shaded section represents the particles that previously did not have the activation energy, but now do and are able to collide successfully. Here's another opportunity to pause the video and make sure that you've understood what we've done so far. Firstly, we're asked to describe and explain the impact of increasing temperature on the rate of reaction. Realistically, at A-level, we're unlikely to get credit for describing because this is really GCC knowledge, but I think it's important that we put it in anyway. So at a higher temperature, the rate of reaction is going to be faster. The reason for this is that a higher proportion of molecules have more energy than the activation energy. In our Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve, they lie to the right of that activation energy line. Therefore, there's going to be a higher frequency of successful collisions or more successful collisions happening per unit time or per second. Remember, even though it is true to say that at a higher temperature, the particles are going to move faster and therefore collide more frequently, at A level, we're not going to get credit for that. The second question asks us to explain why doubling the temperature has a greater impact on the rate than doubling the concentration. The first thing we need to be saying is that the reaction is going to occur when the particles that collide have more energy than the activation energy. If we double the concentration, then we're going to double the number of particles that have that activation energy, because the shape and the distribution of the Maxwell-Boltzmann curve is still exactly the same, just the peak has got twice the height. However, if we double the temperature, then we're going to massively increase the number of particles to the right of that line. Strictly speaking, to answer the question, I only really need to say that it will increase the number of particles by more than two times. But quite often, the A-level specification mark schemes are really quite particular about the fact that you need to not just say that it's going to increase the number of particles to the right of that line, but that it's going to really significantly increase it or increase it by a large amount. To finish off this section, we'll have a quick look at the required practical, which comes up as part of the kinetics topic. In this required practical, you're asked to investigate the impact of temperature on the rate of reaction between hydrochloric acid and sodium thiosulfate. It's quite likely that you would have already done this reaction on a larger scale, slightly lower down the school, because for GCSE chemistry, one of the required practicals involves investigating rate using a method that involves turbidity. And this is one of the few reactions that you're likely to have done in GCSE chemistry where a solution becomes turbid. And that means that it goes cloudy and that happens because there's a solid precipitate being formed. So in this example, the reaction makes sulphur and that yellow precipitate makes the solution go cloudy and makes a cross disappear. Chances are that for A-level, you've done this on a slightly smaller scale using McCartney bottles to allow you to easily change the temperature. And we'll look at how that's done now. Here's the setup for the required practical. 
So I've got um, two McCartney bottles, and one contains some one molar hydrochloric acid, and the other one contains some sodium thiosulfate. And they are in a water bath made out of a takeaway container, and that's got some water in it, um, which in this instance is just at room temperature, but later on I can repeat this using water that's been um, warmed in a kettle. But not higher than 55 degrees, because as we know, one of the products of this reaction is sulphur dioxide, which is really quite irritant and not good for your lungs. So we want to minimise um, how much of that is being produced. So my two bottles have been sat in this water bath um, coming up to a, a fixed temperature. And so I would take the temperature with my thermometer and I would write down that starting temperature there. And then I'm going to use this Pasteur pipette or dropping pipette to put one mil of, um, of the hydrochloric acid into the sodium thiosulfate. And now I would start my stopwatch and because this one is only at room temperature, it's going to be relatively um, relatively slow, have a relatively long time period. And so I'm watching from above to see how long it takes for that cross to disappear. And once I have a time period for this reaction, then I can use that time period to calculate a rate for the reaction. And we can look at, as the temperature increases, what does that do to the rate of reaction? So you can already see um, that solution is starting to go a little bit cloudy as that yellow sulphur precipitate is produced. And at some point we'll decide that that cross has disappeared. And this is obviously a little bit subjective, it's down to my personal judgement. And I would say that now that cross has disappeared. If I wanted to be a little bit more objective about this, then I could use some kind of light sensor and I could um, say when a certain amount of light is no longer being um, transmitted through that solution that that is the end point of the reaction instead. So now I would need to repeat this again and again with different temperatures and also obviously um, repeating at the same temperature to check that my data is repeatable. And once you've done that required practical you might get some data that look a bit like this. If you were using a proper temperature controlled water bath then you wouldn't need to take start and end temperatures but if you're using our system with a takeaway tub then it can be quite useful because we can use this to work out the mean temperature for the reaction overall and this just makes this a little bit more accurate. So for each temperature we've got a time taken for the cross to disappear and then because the amount of sulphur that's produced each time before the cross disappears is the same we can use one divided by time as a sort of a surrogate, a way of working out the initial relative rate. And that gives me my numbers here, which are all to three significant figures. If I plot those onto a graph, I get something that looks a bit like this. It's not a perfect straight line relationship, but it's actually pretty good going. Hopefully that was a useful reminder of everything that you're supposed to know about maxwell boltzmann distributions and the impact of temperature on the rate of reaction. Thank you very much for watching and if you did find it useful don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss more A-Level Chemistry videos coming soon.